The Murray N. Rothbard Medal of Freedom is awarded in recognition of significant and wide-ranging libertarian leadership as a scholar or a public intellectual. It was established through the generosity of the late George W. Connell, who was a uh, Rothbardian mining engineer in Parachute, Colorado. Great. I've never been to Parachute, but it sounds like a great town. So I could talk this afternoon about the many important books that our 2015 recipient has written, the influential journal that he edited and founded, prestigious colleges and universities he's been associated with, not to mention the institutes. Uh, instead, let me just say this. Professor Higgs is not only a great economist and economic historian and a teacher of the first rank, he is a brilliant voice for peace and against the most characteristic of government crimes, the mass murder called war. No wonder Murray Rothbard thought the world of this extraordinary scholar. Indeed, I can't help but think that Murray might be looking down on us right now and saying, boy, Bob. Anyone with the honor to know Dr. Higgs must say the same. Dr. Higgs? Come and let me present this to you. It's the Rothbard Medal. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lou. Uh, it's a tremendous honor uh, for me to receive uh, this particular award. Uh, Murray Rothbard was a dear friend of mine. Uh, I knew him well for the final 10 years or so of his life, and um, I, I mourn him still. So I think that uh, Murray would actually not disapprove of my receiving the Rothbard Medal entirely. Uh, in fact, I think he would in part approve. And I know the part, it would be one part out of 13. And the reason I know that is that um, before I ever knew Murray in person, Murray was asked to review a, um, a manuscript I had written, uh, which would later become a book called Crisis in Leviathan. And uh, Murray uh, prepared this r review, uh, which is something many scholars do for uh, institutes and publishers who have unpublished work they're trying to put in good shape before they publish it. Murray had uh, he reviewed this uh, manuscript uh, for the Pacific Research Institute, was sponsoring my work at the time. And, and uh, most of these reviews are one or two pages, three pages, not a lot of detail, and uh, just some general statements about, you know, this is terrible, or this is, this is okay, uh, that sort of thing. But uh, Murray, uh, being Murray, uh, wrote instead a, a typescript of 26 pages, um, uh, written as he wrote everything on his typewriter, uh, with crossouts to correct his typos and uh, things written in in, in, in pen. I, I have a copy of it right here. And uh, the way it proceeds is the first two pages are, are full of praise for my manuscript. Uh, and then the next 24 pages are detailed criticisms. <laughs> so that's, uh, that means uh, one out of 13. <laughs> From Murray, that wasn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, for, for those who love Murray and love anecdotes about his life, uh, this, this little report has become, I think, famous in a small circle. So I, I brought a copy to leave it with Lou this time, uh, not knowing whether I'll ever be back here again. And, uh, and uh, this will be a kind of legacy of mine to the Mises Institute. Uh, by the way, the Mises Institute ha has, uh, has been wonderful to me over the years. Uh, it's been a privilege for me to work with the Institute uh, in various ways, uh, not only in the uh, Mises University, which is always a joy, uh, but uh, in a variety of other ways, uh, in other conferences and, uh, and helping out in, in, in ways that, that I could over the years. So this has been a wonderful association for me, uh, and... Um, uh, it's it's terrific to see how the Institute's programs have developed 
they become bigger, they become better. Uh, the level of scholarship of the scholars teaching the program has, has become even better, and it, it was always good, but it's even better now. And as uh, Joe Salerno was saying, uh, there are whole new generations of young Austrian economists who've come along since I, I started uh, almost 30 years ago, uh, my association with the Mises Institute. And, and, and some of these people, I look at them, and, and I'm thinking that, uh, as I call them, my boys, but you know they're they're 45 years old now, and that doesn't seem quite right. Uh, so <laughs> they've matured, they've done wonderful things, and uh, some of them. Um, are actually my heroes. So, can't do any better than that as a teacher. Speaking of teaching, I want to try to uh, do a little bit in the rest of the uh, session here today. And what I want to talk to you about is the subject of war and the growth of government, which uh, clearly I've been working on for a long time. I'm still learning because wars keep happening and so there's new empirical material to integrate, new things to think about, uh, new hypotheses to test about my own uh, ideas uh, about this subject. And um, uh, I suppose anybody who's been deeply invested in a particular interpretation of anything is, is hard to talk out of it. So I must confess that I, I don't often encounter something that looks like uh, debunking of my views in this subject, but uh, that's not to say they aren't out there somewhere or that I've simply been blind to them when I've looked at them with my own eyes. But at all events, it seemed to me over the years that some of the early ideas I developed on this subject have held up pretty well, uh, including in recent years since the 9-11 attacks and the full-fledged uh, so-called war on terror uh, of the United States government. So uh, I want to, uh, to walk you through some uh, basics of this topic. Now, I'm, I'm sure you've all heard the, um, the statement by Randolph Bourne uh, from an unpublished uh, manuscript in 1918, uh, which says, war is the health of the state. Uh, for, for many libertarians, this is a kind of shibboleth or or mantra, uh, and uh, you know, just as uh, just uh, as you might, if you were a Randian, you might go around talking to strangers and approach them by asking, you know, uh, where is John Galt, uh, to find out whether they were comrades or not. Uh, if you if you were my kind of libertarian, you might approach a stranger and say, "War is the health of the state," and you know then you would wait to see whether they punched you in the nose or said, "Yeah, <laughs> that's for damn sure." <laughs> uh, so uh, that's not to say every libertarian uh, in the world is an outstanding anti-war person. Some of them are not, but. Uh, even though I have not been uh, very active in fighting with my fellow libertarians through the years, this is one issue on which I've had to take a stand. Uh, this is key. War is what I call the master key of the state. It's the key that opens every other door to take away your liberties. And if you support opening that door, you have let out a monster and you will rue the day you supported war. It is the health of the state in every conceivable way. I'd like to recommend right now at this point something Danny Sanchez wrote a few weeks ago on that idea of war as the health of the state because he developed it uh, with a depth and in a direction that I uh, hadn't seen before uh, done so well. So... Uh, Look up Danny's essay. Uh, it'll be easy to find uh, on the web or at his website. So another reason for being interested in the relationship between uh, war and the state is that uh, war has been 
the major source, directly and indirectly, of the growth of government. And you can see this in a variety of data series. Um, when we talk about the size of the government, we can measure it in a variety of ways. There are any number of indexes of the size of government, how much it spends, how much it spends relative to national income, how many people it employs, how much revenue it collects, uh, how, how many dollars it borrows. There, there are many, many respectable measures of the, the size of the government. Uh, but th this uh, measure outlays as a percent of gross domestic product is, is probably the most common uh, one uh, among economists, although not the best one. And I've recently written myself um, in the independent review about some of the problems associated not just with this measure, the size of government, but with, with gross domestic product, period. Uh, there's a whole set of concepts that we get from the national income and product accounts, seldom questioned by economists, you know, be part of the basic uh, data that all macroeconomists and many other economists use every day, and yet highly problematic. But however that may be, if we use this measure, we see some interesting things from this long series going back to uh, the late 18th century. We can see, for example, that, that uh, the fed federal government was very small by this measure. Uh, in fact, uh, except during the war between the states, uh, and if we are able to push it back a little further to the, uh, the American Revolution, uh, we'd see a little, little uh, a blip there as well. But uh, except during that time, it, it was not until World War I that the, the federal government spending relative to GDP ever rose above uh, uh, three, three or four uh, percent. So it's a tiny factor in social life. And we can see that if we just read the history of the United States and ask, what did the federal government do? How many people did it employ? What laws did it enforce? And the answer is, in any case, not very many. And even of those uh, it, it did try to enforce, the laws it tried to enforce, it, it was often not able to do so very effectively. Of the taxes it tried to collect, it was often not very good at collecting them, and so forth. So the government was small, and it was weak. That is, it was, if you must have a government, it was ideal. Uh, so <clears throat> that's how the government of this country uh, was at the federal level, and the state and local governments were somewhat bigger in the 19th century, but they were not huge things either. Uh, so throwing them all together and working up to the early 20th century, we would find that uh, only about 7 or 8 percent of G GDP was the total of uh, all government spending at that time. And uh, at any previous time, it, it tended to be even less. So the government remains small by this measure. Now, let me repeat, this is only one measure, and there are other ways of looking at the size of the government uh, which tell a somewhat different story. Uh, so uh, you should always bear in mind when you talk about this topic the, the caveat that goes with any particular measure. And another reason for bearing that in mind is that some mainstream economists like to debunk ideas such as mine by taking a data series and doing some kind of e econometrics on it and saying, wow, look, uh, it doesn't work the way Higgs says. Well, Higgs didn't say just one thing about the growth of government. And that's where some of my ideas, particularly the ones I'll discuss today, differ from those that may go under the same name in mainstream economics and political science. I take a broader view of, of the government uh, and a broader view of how we understand its size, scope, and power. And I think it's necessary to take that broader view, otherwise we, we tend to be misled by any given measure. By this measure, though, we do see some very interesting things, and that is that, uh, First of all, all, this government is very small up until World War I, except during the, uh, the war between the states, when there's a, 
a spike that dry, drives it up several fold. Uh, but it comes back down, and in fact, by the, by the time we get up to World War I, it's almost back to the level it was before that war. So there's been a, a, quite, quite a lot of retrenchment by this measure. Okay? And then in World War I, there's an even bigger spike, and that comes down, but not all the way. If you look carefully, it doesn't come back to the same percentage it was before World War I. In fact, it's probably twice what it was before that war, after, afterwards in the 1920s. Uh, then there's a leap during the onset of the Great Depression, and then a much, much bigger leap during World War II, and this was the, you know, the war of all wars in U.S. history uh, in terms of its uh, draw on resources and manpower and uh, money and practically everything else you can think of, including the people's liberties. Uh, but the other thing you can see is that starting from around 1930 or so, even if you ignore the spikes uh, during World War II and, 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 and Korea and uh, the recent war on terror, if you ignore those, there's, there's a steady upward trend uh, in the data that wasn't there in the 19th century, all the way up to, to World War I. So something has happened, and uh, the question is, is this just because some long-run forces changed the behavior of the trend? Was there something going on in in society or something going on in the wide world of politics that, uh, that changed uh, what had been a, a small government not growing uh, to a bigger and bigger government for a century now uh, that was independent of the, these wars, which we see uh, re represented or, or evinced in these spikes. Uh, and it... The usual way that econometricians think about this is, is to almost block out the spikes. Sometimes economists have been so audacious as to leave war periods out of their data set where they're trying to understand the long-run growth of government. They say, oh, we're not interested in these abnormal events. Uh, they're atypical. They're, they're special. They're, they're not representing the forces that are driving the long-run tendency of the government to get bigger and bigger. That's a fundamental mistake. It's a mistake that any good historian would not make. And an expression of why it's a mistake was pronounced long ago in the late 19th century by William Graham Sumner who was at the time a, a well-known social scientist uh, at Yale University. And Sumner, Sumner said, you cannot experiment with a society and just drop the experiment whenever you choose. The experiment enters into the life of the society and never can be got out again. As we're talking about human beings, we're talking about people who didn't just look at statistical data. They lived through these events. They were participants. They were put upon, or they were putting upon their neighbors. In any event, they were engaged. And when they, these big events ended, they didn't just forget what had just happened. It became part of their thinking. In some cases, it had altered their thinking in important ways. So when we talk about history, we're not talking about something that can be represented as a statistician represents a time series. The statistician looks at this and he thinks every year is something drawn from a distribution by a random sample. That's not how history works. No given year is a random sample of the possible things that could happen that year. There are built into what people do in any given time background features, background features that have shaped their understanding, their desires, their values. And it's those things that they act upon. Those are the bases from which they launch their behavior at any given time. 
We're not talking about atoms here that bounce around in a Brownian motion. We're talking about people, each of one, each one of which has a biography, has memories, has outlooks, has in many cases an ideology that allows him to assess what is going on in the world, how he feels about it, how he thinks people should deal with it. Right. So, if we look at this historically and we think, well, there's this upward trend, uh, maybe it's not independent of these big spikes, such as World War I. And indeed, when we do the history, we'll find that that is precisely the case. That there's anything but independence there. Now, when I started investigating this subject, I, I was still a cleometrician, as they're called, a, they, they used to be called new economic historians, but now all of us new economic historians are old men and women, so it doesn't seem like a good name anymore. But uh, <laughs> we, were, we were the young, young people that came roaring into the economics profession and said, economic history is old-fashioned. It needs to be brought up to date, and the way to do this is by bringing a f economic theory, which for us was mainstream economic theory, uh, neoclassical theory, bringing economic theory and uh, statistics, econometrics to bear in the analysis of these historical questions. And so a bunch of us has actually pulled off this little um, uh, palace coup in the economic history profession of the United States. We actually took over the teaching of economic history, at least in economics departments. Now, some departments cut us off at the pass uh, by just dropping all their economic history courses. <laughs> so <laughs> that defeated us. But uh, insofar as economic history continued to be taught in uh, economics departments, the cleometricians uh, became the, the, the teachers. And uh, so part of being a good cleometrician is looking at all the data before you get started. Say, well, you know, what does the evidence show? The evidence meaning quantitative evidence, evidence that you can, you can bring to bear uh, econometric methods on. And so I looked at a lot of series and uh, like this, but by different measures for different times uh, from different sources and so forth. And, uh, and from uh, the whole collection of them, I found that there was a pattern that I observed again and again and again, not always identical in one series to its manifestation in another series, but very much the same. And so I, I call this pattern the ratchet effect. And here I've got a schematic representation of it, which I use just to discuss it in a general way. Uh, what I have on the vertical axis here, which I, I, I realize you can't read this, that's why I'm going to tell you. Uh, the vertical axis me measures uh, the logarithm, but that's not important so much, uh, of, of a, an index of the true size of government. <laughs> and what I meant by that code term, the true size was an idealized index that would take into account the government's size, scope, and power all at once, somehow. I didn't do it. I didn't try to create such an index, but I can imagine one. And if I'd wanted to do it, I could. Okay? But the point is, you don't want to select just size or just scope or just power. You want to consider that the growth of government involves all these dimensions and others. So you've got a, a measure, a good general measure, true measure of, of the size of government. You're tracking it over time. And in this case, we see a government that's tending to grow in the left-hand part of the drawing. But something happens here at point B, uh, a national emergency. And it can be of different kinds. It might be an economic emergency, like the economic collapse that started in mid-1929. It, it might be a war emergency, uh, like the onset of the world wars. It, it might be a labor emergency, like some a national strike or potential national strike, the, the kind that 
faced the country back in 1916, for example, uh, and led to the passage of something called the Adamson Act. Uh, but it, regardless of the nature of the national emergency, the national emergency uh, creates a response from government that shows up in our index. It causes government to grow abruptly, much quicker than it was growing before during the pre-crisis normality. It becomes bigger, and in my stylized version, it, it stays at a high level for a while. That it doesn't exactly do that in any real emergency. It fluctuates even during the crisis, but at all events, it rises to a high level, stays there for a while, and then the crisis ends. The war comes to an end. The labor dis disturbance is settled. You know, the depression is over. Whatever the nature of the emergency, it ends, and the government retrenches. But when it retrenches, it does not return to its size before the onset of the emergency, <clears throat> nor does it fall enough to get back on the trend line that it would have been on had it continued to grow at the same rate as during the pre-crisis period. Okay. That line I have here uh, in the middle, this sloping line, that's an extension of the pre-crisis trend. Uh, we would have been at E prime if we'd continued growing at point T3. But we're not at T prime, E prime. We're up here at E. That's the actual point we reached. We didn't have full retrenchment. And from that point, then we returned to something like the growth that was going on before the crisis. And that, again, is not essential. It could be faster after the crisis or slower. But all that's important is that for some time, the post-crisis growth remains at a higher level. The trajectory is above the old trajectory. And it's worth reminding ourselves also, because it's true, that the assumption that it would have grown this way along the same growth path had this emergency never taken place may well be false. It may be that had that emergency not occurred, the growth of the government would have tended to slow or stop. And that it was indeed the emergency and the way the government responded to it that allowed it to keep growing as fast as it was before the crisis. That is to say, the government's growth process may need refreshment from the springs of national emergency. And if so, then matters are even worse in terms of the ratchet than I generally portray them. Okay. Now, we could say, as some statisticians have, well, it's just a correlation yeah, uh, war and the growth of the government have tended to go together, but it's just a correlation, so what? You know, maybe it's an accident. Maybe it's a coincidence. You know, where, where's your statistical test? Well, what I want to do today mainly is show you the logic of why it's not just a coincidence. It's not just an accident. There's a logic built in to the way the government responds to national emergency. And I'm going to focus today particularly on the most important national emergency, which is war. When the government undertakes to prosecute a large-scale war, and that's important, if it's just going to attack some uh, tropical island, uh, this kind of analysis is beside the point. Or if it already has a gigantic military ap apparatus in place and it decides to attack Serbia, you're looking at a different case there. It'll just conduct that war out of inventory, as it were. Okay. But if we're looking at a war that requires a substantial diversion of resources as a uh, as the world wars did for all their, their belligerent powers, and certainly did for the United States because it had uh, hardly any military to speak of uh, when these wars began, uh, then, then the government needs uh, 
uh, to divert many resources away from their current uses, especially civilian uses, into uses that will assist the government in prosecuting the war effectively. So how can the government engineer that reallocation of resources? Well, the first thing the government could do was explain to the people, uh, we've got a situation here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're at war. Uh, we're at war for good reason. You know, the wolf is at the door. We must ward him off. Uh, and so in order to do that, we have to have your assistance. So we need you to donate resources sufficient to allow us to defend the country in the way that we've decided is best defended. So the Treasury's door is open. Uh, please leave your donations. Now, <clears throat> that's not what it does because the, even the densest politician knows that nobody will come and drop off money at the Treasury. Okay? But uh, there is one way in which the government gets a little bit of response to this sort of appeal, and that is it always appeals to, to men, and nowadays to women as well. Join the armed forces. It always says, you know, that we need to recruit a much larger number of people for the Army and the Navy. So, so come down and sign up. Become a soldier or sailor. And, and, and sometimes... Uh, adventurous and ignorant young men uh, will respond to those appeals and they'll go down thinking they're going to prove their manhood or, or do something else to satisfy their, their friends and relatives. Uh, and they'll go down and enlist. And that happened uh, during all the wars to some extent. But it was never nearly enough to provide the government with the size army it needed to be effective in the war it wanted to prosecute. Uh, just a trickle of men came down after the United States declared war in World War I. In World War II, uh, the government actually started drafting men long before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, so it didn't even wait to see that opening the door to the the forts would, uh, would elicit enough men to come in and volunteer their services. So this whole idea of people's unwillingness to donate their resources to the government's prosecution of the war is completely typical. Uh, now, I want you to pause here right now. This seems like such an obvious point that you're probably saying, why is this guy going on belaboring this obvious point? And I'm doing it because there's a deeper point at play here. Suppose you lived in a town or a village that came under attack from some enemy. Your family members were being killed. Your friends. Shells were exploding here and there. Would you go to the defense of the, of the community? Well, some people might not, but many people would. Many people would. You don't have to tell people to defend themselves against marauders. You don't need to concoct a big story about the threat to national security. When people are under attack, they defend themselves as best they can. And sometimes they do a pretty damn good job. There are historians who argue, for example, that in the Revolutionary War, the only effective military action <laughs> the North American colonists mounted was basically guerrilla action. Uh, you know, Washington's pathetic army, which was always in retreat, uh, did practically nothing except run away and run away again. But some of these guerrilla forces were pretty good. They, had, they would run out and attack the British, and then they'd just disappear into the forest. But the point was, you, you didn't have to draft these guys. Uh, they were militiamen. They were people who belonged to their communities, and defending their communities was what ordinary people expected to do and did. 
Hmm? When the government has to undertake a lot of coercive measures to prosecute a war, what you're seeing is evidence that it's not just going to war against the alleged enemy, it's going to war against the people themselves, the people the government purports to be protecting. Because the very first thing it's doing to provide this alleged protection is violating their rights. Drafting them as military slaves, taking their money and new taxes, taking land away from them to build military facilities. These are attacks on the people's rights. If the people wanted to provide these resources to the government for war, it would hand them over. You wouldn't have to coerce them. So the point is, governments go to war both on the military front and on the home front. They go together. And it's, a, it's the government's attack on the home front that creates such a hazard because that's where the people lose their liberties during the war and because of ratchet effects, never get all of them back when the war is over. That's why war, over time, is the health of the state. It keeps providing the state with more and more power, and the people with less and less liberty. Okay, donations aren't working, so how's the government going to fight the war? Well, it's going to have to pay for resources. Where does it get the money? It raises taxes, puts taxes up to higher, higher rates. Uh, it imposes new kinds of taxes. It taxes people who weren't being taxed before, goods that weren't being taxed before. And when it does that, people don't just roll over and say, oh, well, got to pay more taxes. That's life. They try to evade these taxes. They try to avoid them. They try to rearrange their affairs so they won't be subject to such great takings. And so the government's now got a problem. This, by the way, is an example of uh, the Misesian theory of intervention. Okay? <laughs> That's a theory that says when the government undertakes to do something by intervening in the private society or economy, it, it creates feedback effects, which, as it were, are problems that the government must, must then solve in a second stage. And the same thing happens at the second stage. So then there's a third stage. And this was something James Madison actually wrote about in The Federalists when he said that each legislative interference is but the cause of succeeding ones, each one proceeding from the one that came before it. So this is not uh, an, an Isaac Newton-style observation, you don't have to have keen intelligence to see this. The Misesian theory of intervention is sort of obvious to anyone who sort of followed the news or learned some history. That's how government operates. It intervenes, creates a problem, deals with the problem, okay? So here it intervenes by taxing people more. It encounters tax avoidance and evasion. So it's got to deal with the avoidance and evasion. It's got to hire more tax collectors, more agents at the IRS, more FBI agents to go investigate people for, for criminal uh, acts connected with tax evasion and avoidance, and so on and on. And when it does that, it creates effects that it has to deal with, and so forth. Okay? So it can't just simply raise taxes at any level it wants and get the resources it wants. And in fact, in all the major wars, the government covered the bulk of its expenses by borrowing money. Now, borrowing is easier because you're not really threatening the lenders. You're trying to induce the lenders. You're saying, give us your money and we'll pay you interest on the, your loan and, and at some date in the future, which we stipulate, we'll repay your principal amount. So, you know, you'll get something out of this, just like any lender gets something out of lending money. So the government resorts to a lot of borrowing to pay for wars and 
When it does that, it's flooding the bond market with a lot of new bonds, driving their prices down, and therefore driving the effective yield on those securities up. You see, if, the, if there's a bond with a face value of $100 and it promises every year to pay $5 interest, okay, that's a 5% yield. But if there's so many bonds floating around out there uh, seeking buyers, these bonds will only fetch $50, then $5 a year in interest is a 10% yield. Okay? So the effective yield gets higher and higher as the government tries to borrow more and more, and the higher it gets, the greater discouragement it is to the government's borrowing. It makes the borrowing more expensive, less effective in serving the government's purposes. So there's that kind of reaction. How can it deal with that reaction? Well, in the World Wars, the government used the new central bank, the Federal Reserve System. And the Fed came riding to the rescue by using monetary policies of lending or buying securities in the open market, which created very easy credit conditions, especially for commercial banks, and they, in turn, were able to make easier loans to their borrowers. And so the, the whole economy was getting pumped up, thanks to the Fed, uh, with effusions of credit spreading out throughout the system. But one place it spread to was increasing the demand for government securities, which was the whole idea. The whole idea. <laughs> Not just some pleasant side effect for the government. That's why this was done to finance the government's war. So the Fed rides to the rescue, and besides pumping up credit right and left, uh, it imposes interest rate controls, uh, and in some cases, capital market controls, because there are still other effects when you start intervening in the financial markets on a, on a large scale. So we, we've got more intervention triggered by intervention. So the government gets money by taxing or borrowing. It goes out and makes purchases. But if this is a big war, it's making purchases of certain items on a large scale. And when it does that, the effect of increasing demand is to increase the prices of these items. And as they get more and more expensive, it puts the government in a bigger and bigger bind. How is it going to pay for all the stuff it wants? when each unit is getting more expensive. So it's got to deal with that. So it, it, it deals with that by, by killing the messenger, okay? The messenger is the rising prices. It's, it's telling the government, these items you want are getting dearer. Their opportunity cost is rising, and you can't have them voluntarily from sellers unless you pay a higher price to get them. But when the government imposes price controls, as it did on a selective scale in World War I and on a comprehensive scale in World War II, it kills the messenger. It says, things aren't really dearer. They're not more expensive because we've got a law that says you can't make them more expensive. Well, if you think through what really goes on in the economy, that doesn't really change anything real. That's like saying if I rig the thermometer, I'd change how hot it is in here. Okay? It wouldn't. It doesn't change the fact that the government is trying to snatch higher and higher valued goods away from people who aren't willing to sell them except at higher prices, but they can't sell at higher prices because the government has made that unlawful. And in many cases in the World Wars, the government simply, simply didn't even fool with the uh, Price controls, it, it simply passed laws giving itself the power to take resources or to set priorities or make allocations of materials uh, in such a way that it would be able to get what it wanted for the war mobilization, either for itself or for its private contractors. Now, when you do that, there's still compliance problems. Every time the government puts into effect a new regulation, a new control, a new allocation, there are people who find it in their interest to violate that regulation, to cheat on those controls, and so forth. 
and the government then has to deal with that, with enforcement efforts. Now, notice every time it deals with one of these negative feedback effects, it's, a, it's sending out coercive agents. It's trying to squash people who are reacting negatively to what it's doing. The final form uh, of transferring resources is to just take them to, for example, draft men into the armed forces uh, by conscription and uh, send them a letter that says, greetings. That's what they used to say. They said, greetings. <laughs> Your old Uncle Sam is sending you a greeting. Uh, greetings, uh, you, you are to report, and they'd tell you where to report on a certain date. And it might even give you a week or two to get there. Uh, and if you didn't report as ordered, you became what was popularly known as a draft dodger. And that meant that you had the option, the other option the government gave you. If you didn't want to report, you could uh, actually go to prison. So... Since that was not a good option for most people, uh, the great majority of people just showed up as ordered rather than go to prison. But not all of them. In World War I, the evasion rate was actually pretty high. It was about 11%. Of all the people ordered to submit to the draft, they just melted away somewhere. And, of course, some of them were eventually tracked down, but in but in 1918, uh, it was harder to track down people than it is now. There was no uh, national security agency. But in World War II, uh, there was much less draft evasion and uh, avoidance, any of that. And the people who chose to go to prison instead of submitting to the draft were mostly uh, members of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, whose religion told them, don't. Don't put man ahead of God. Now, all Christians, all Muslims, <laughs> believe that, right? I think uh, we should put God above man. But when you have to walk the walk, it's different. And uh, very few Christians uh, chose to walk the walk of peace when the government sent them the notice that said report for war. So, we've got a lot of attempts to transfer resources to war uses, and we've got a lot of negative feedbacks for the government. And so the government's got to suppress resistance. And the most important way in which it's got to suppress resistance is resistance to enlarging the armed forces themselves. Because... If you can't build them up, I mean, er everything else is worthless. They're the whole purpose. And when people go out and, and uh, try to discourage young men from enlisting or try to discourage them from reporting for the draft, the government gets very upset about that especially. Especially. So the penalties provided by law for, re for interfering with the draft or with the enlistment of soldiers uh, are very severe in World War I. Uh, that could get you 20 years in a federal prison for interfering with the government's enlistment or draft efforts. And your interference might amount to nothing more than standing on a street corner and saying to somebody, somebody, these guys shouldn't report for the draft. It's wicked. That's worth 20 years. Right there. A lot of people went to prison during World War I for resisting the draft or for speaking out against the war in one way or another. Eugene Debs, who was a famous lab labor leader and politician of those days, was one who gave a speech uh, about the draft and uh, was convicted of uh, violating the Sedition Act, uh, which was a draconian law the government passed in 1918 which was a law that basically said any form of criticism of the armed forces, their, their symbols, their uniform, the flag, their leaders, uh, or anything else having to do with the war is guilty of a felony and would, would be punished by, by imprisonment in terms indicated in the law, some of which ran up to 20 years. 
So a lot of people went to prison during the war uh, for nothing more than just exercising their First Amendment rights of speech because <clears throat> your First Amendment rights basically didn't exist during wartime. They existed totally at the sufferance of the warring state. And sometimes it just didn't have any patience with little things like First Amendment rights, which, by the way, it was purporting to defend by its war actions. Get your mind wrapped around all the inconsistencies that are part and parcel of a government at war, especially one that purports to be defending a free society. It's the classic case of destroying the village in order to save it. If that's how you have to do it, you've already lost. And you might as well save everybody a lot of trouble. Hmm? So the government restricted rights of assembly, speech, press, petition for redress of grievances. It shut down uh, practically all the foreign language newspapers in the country. At that time in World War I, there were thousands of such newspapers because about 15% of the population was foreign born and, and a similar proportion was first generation Americans. So the foreign language press was very big and the government put such onerous controls on uh, those uh, newspapers and magazines that almost all of them stopped publication. Some of them it forbade the use of the mails, which meant they couldn't be sent to their subscribers anymore because that's how they reached the subscribers in those days. Uh, so they were suppressing free speech, especially among uh, suspect people, none more than people who wrote or spoke in German. And there were Millions and millions of such people in the United States at that time. The Germans had been the largest of all immigrant groups that had come to the United States in the preceding century. And so there are many, many Germans or people of German descent in the country. And you kind of wonder sometimes how the government got away with stuff like not allowing Beethoven symphonies to be played at concerts. Really. How stupid can you get? <laughs> That's how stupid a nation at war gets. That stupid. Okay. And of course, the whole country in both world wars was barraged with propaganda. People were signed up as government spokesmen. In World War I, they got all these people they called three-minute men. Actors, celebrities, socially prominent people, and they would go out in some public place you know, like Times Square in New York City, and they, they'd give a speech for three minutes exhorting everybody to support the war and lend money to the government, buy government bonds, and so forth. In World War II, to an even greater extent, Hollywood, which was a big deal by that time, was basically uh, made an arm of the government to propagandize people, especially to, to pay their taxes uh, and to buy government bonds, of course. Uh, there was everywhere you went during those wars, you encountered this propaganda to, to, to uh, buy bonds, buy bonds, buy bonds, uh, and to take other other actions. Many of them symbolic, but some of them substantive. Uh, it wasn't just exhorting people; it was also a huge and large amount of the police apparatus. Uh, uh, the FBI increased the number of agents in World War II several fold. In World War I, the agency that later became the FBI was created, and that's where this uh, fellow named J. Edgar Hoover got his start, uh, ultimately becoming arguably the most powerful man in America over a period of about 50 years, uh, because even, even presidents knew that Hoover had, had information on them. He kept it in his personal file, which was available only to him. And if you didn't uh, go his way, you know, he might uh, put out the word on you. In short, Hoover was the guy blackmailing the government of the United States for 40 or 50 years. And he, he was spawned by World War I. Informants are always encouraged at times like this. People are in 
called out to report on their relatives, their friends, their neighbors. If you see something, say something. Okay? And of course, there's some nosy busybodies that see something very easily. And so they, if they've got any grievance against their neighbor, say something. Look at my neighbor. I think he's a Taliban. Uh. <laughs> And then on top of this, while the government is trying to learn everything about the people, it's trying to prevent the people from learning anything about it. So the level of government secrecy rises. Uh, more and more information is classified, kept secret, uh, not revealed to the public, often not revealed to members of Congress even. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, this is the way wars get fought because... This is the war on the home front. People aren't making donations. Coercion has to be brought to bear against them, and when they react to that, the government has to suppress those reactions. And in that course of suppression, people's liberties are squashed, sometimes forever. Now, crises end. Both the World Wars ended. Eh? The Great Depression ended. When they end, there's some retrenchment. The government can no longer persuade people to put up with everything they were putting up with during the crisis. And so there is some fallback, but not a complete one. And we see that in different aspects of the government. One of them is fiscal. Even in the 1920s, after World War I, the taxes that had been raised so much during the war were never put back to pre-war levels, or even close to those levels. They were lowered somewhat during the Coolidge administration, but still, by 1928, uh, the, the top tax rate was 24%, I believe, 24 or 25. Before the war, the top tax rate was 7%. So taxes had a big ratchet effect in them. Government spending had a big ratchet effect in it. And it wasn't simply because now there were a lot of veterans who were getting money spent on them for their care, or for their pensions. There's a variety of other things the government was now spending more for as well, because during wartime, opportunists always come forth to pretend they're making some contribution to the war, even though it's very far-fetched that what they're doing adds anything significant to the success of the war effort. But people like to come forth and say they're doing something that makes them deserving of government largest. So other people get a, a, to ride along with the great train uh, of war making. There are institutional ratchets that are even more important than the fiscal ones. It's, uh, the government's budget can go up and down. It's very easy to write new numbers in the budget each year. But if you create a new law, it's a big deal to get rid of that law, to repeal it. Okay? If you create new organizations, it's a big deal to stop their operation, to shut them down. And if you create precedents, such as the precedents of Supreme Court rulings during World War I that, that said the government has every right to suppress people's First Amendment speech rights, that's going to be a precedent forever. That precedent may be dragged down in any number of briefs later, some of them having nothing to do with war, to justify the government's suppression of speech. Probably the most important ratchet effects of all in the United States history were ideological ratchets. During the war, the government did a lot of unusual things, and propagandized people, and after the war, it continued to propagandize them with interpretations by important actors in the war program that the government had been a big success, that these actions it had taken across the board were part and parcel of winning the war. So they were great. They were good. So great and good, in fact, that they were the kinds of things that we might well consider doing even in peacetime. That argument was made again and again and again, even by people like Herbert Hoover, who were not, you know, not exactly rabid status, but Hoover made that argument more than once. And certainly the people that were 
Leaders in the Roosevelt administration during the New Deal made it repeatedly. Look, we did this thing during World War I. We can do it now during the Great Depression, which Roosevelt himself described, or not Roosevelt, but Justice Brandeis described as an, an emergency more serious than war. So if we did something in war, certainly we can do it during the Depression. And a whole host of wartime measures were revived and put into place by the Roosevelt administration and, to some extent, even earlier by the Hoover administration. And then, of course, when World War II came, everything was done again, except on a bigger scale, to more people, for more time. And the victory was greater, more decisive. Look, we defeated the Nazi war machine. We defeated the whole of Japanese imperial aggression in East Asia. Look at these wonderful accomplishments. If the government can do that, surely it can give everybody a decent house to live in and a job at high pay. Surely. <laughs> well, if it were just a matter of dropping atomic bombs on them, maybe. Uh, but there's no real analogy here. This is one of those easy analogies you hear in politics all the time, that if you think about it, it just collapses. There's no substance. There's no analogy between what was done in World War I and what would have been a sensible policy in 1933. They're two totally different situations. You may call each one of them an emergency, but that doesn't get you anywhere. That doesn't tell you how to deal with it. But nonetheless, these ideological ratchets have taken place. And as a result, after repeated crises in a short period of U.S. history, the reigning ideology of the United States was changed uh, to a very high degree. Classical liberalism or anything like it was driven into the corner. Uh, collectivism, uh, democratic socialism, uh, emergency fascism, all these things came to the fore and stayed at the fore ever since then. So, beware going to war, ladies and gentlemen. You will almost certainly live to regret it. Thank you very much.